Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to another edition of House Call with Dr. Gigi. Of course, you know I'm not Dr. Gigi. I am LSD, her co-host for tonight's uh, show. And if you missed last week's show, you missed a doozy. We really talked about blood pressure and it was a wonderful, wonderful program. So I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel or our Facebook page to check out that program. And it really broke the Dr. Gigi does such a wonderful job of breaking things down. So us folks can, uh, the, uh, us regular folks can understand it. And we broke down blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure or, or flirting with hypertension, or if you have a family member, please go check out that program. It gives you all the wonderful information so you can go be your own best health advocate. And that's what we're here to do. So tonight we have a wonderful program for you. But first thing, you know, we've got some instructions. Let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to hear where you see where you're watching from. And we'll put that on screen as you're checking in from your cities all around the country and all over the world. We had some people from Taiwan and South Africa check in. So please check in and let us know where you're watching from. And also, if you are finding something that you enjoy, that somebody else needs to hear this, feel free to share it. Share it, like the program, share it with your friends. Don't be a stranger to us because we are not a stranger to you. This program is all about you and things that you need to do and things that you can need to know to be your own best health, health, health advocate for you and your family and your community. So we're going to build it out. So we've got a wonderful, wonderful program tonight. We're going to be talking to, we got a special guest for you. So we're excited to have a special guest. I think it'll just be our first guest tonight, Dr. Gigi, our first guest ever. So please give her a warm welcome and ask all the questions you have. But I'm going to be quiet and bring on the person of the hour. And that is, of course, Dr. Gigi. How are you doing? I am fine. Better for seeing you, Mr. Ellis. It's always a pleasure. How are you doing? I am doing really, really good. I, I had a, it was a holiday weekend. I didn't get a chance to uh, party as much as you know some people did, as I saw the news, because um, I had some, some family business to, to attend to. But it's always good to have a long weekend to get a chance to try to recharge and refresh your battery. So how was your weekend? It was, it was nice. You know, the first couple of days here in D.C., the weather wasn't great. But, you know, in a way, it was kind of nice because it gave you permission to just rest. And then, mm -hmm. of course, yesterday was a gorgeous day. But I hope that your family's all OK now. Yeah. You know, it, it's just, you know, parents are getting older. And so sometimes uh, they need some assistance. And so I had to, you know, head down to Florida and, and, mm -hmm. and check on them in person. You know, there's so many things, mm -hmm. so much you can do virtually and, and, and on the phone. And sometimes you just got to show up and be present. And so I think that was the most important thing for, uh, for both my parents is for me to show up and be present. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm that. not surprised that you are such a good son. Uh, truly, <laughs> really, I'm not. I'm not being being funny. I think that uh, you know we as human beings derive a lot of joy from our family, but it's also about being responsible with our families, especially at their greatest time of need. And it's when our parents and other beloved family members get older, because it's just a you know that time is more and more precious especially as you get older you realize mm -hmm. okay this is you know when you're a teenager you thought up oh, you never thought about how long your folks would live and then of course um hey mr D daner or danner somebody said hello <laughs> uh, but yeah yeah um but yeah thank you it's, it's good to be here today and uh i guess we're gonna go with the COVID update right? yes yes so um we we're rapidly, we're at that slow down point, you know, of course, because we're right about, I think 50% um, of the country has been vaccinated. And the harder group, you know, that, that last 20 to 30% to, to, to get to herd immunity is gonna be harder to get. They're still on the fence, they still have questions, but we're noticing there has been more polarization um, for what I can see on the news with regards to people pushing uh, not only from the mask mandates, but to just being vaccinated. And we've had some, and I don't want to give too much, you know, credibility to the one-off stories because we know that the media is sensational, right? And right. so they are going to highlight the extremes. Right. And so um, I, I, I like to think most of us are in the middle somewhere with, re with regards to, to vaccinations, but it's still, we still have a long ways to go in terms of being able to reach that herd immunity so we can all feel comfortable. And I think right. that's where Well, you know, with. in terms of vaccinations and who's not getting vaccinated, who's getting vaccinated, first of all, the people that are sort of never vaxxers are actually mostly white male Republicans. So let's mm -hmm. start off with that. 
uh, in terms of uh, communities of color and specifically African-American communities, I want to just tell you that community leadership is just doing some amazing work and really kind of taking it down to individual neighborhoods and communities. So you see barbershop initiatives, you see salon initiatives, you see faith-based initiatives, other community-based organizations. And you know, at the end of the day, you know, those kinds of conversations to say, oh, I'm not sure, or what, what do you think? That really has to be sort of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think the less judgmental that we are, <laughs> the mm -hmm. better that it can be for people to have conversations. And, you know, I mean, I, I would love it for everybody get, to get vaccinated, but I'm not somebody that is going to do a hard sell. You know, it's right. important to understand what the reasons people have for not. Is there misinformation to kind of dispel, to educate, so that people can make their best decision for themselves? Right. But I think that as more and more of us do get vaccinated, um, there's a worry that people are like, oh, OK, well, it's over, which right. is not true. And of course, leaves the people that are not vaccinated really vulnerable. I mean, yep. you know, I can think of some people that um, are not getting vaccinated because of fears or I, I'm thinking of one of my patients specifically. She's 96 and her mm. two daughters decided that they didn't want to vaccinate her. They just that's fine. Um, so they don't also take her out. You know, they're very strict when they go outside so that they don't bring anything home. That kind of hypervigilance really has to continue. Okay. If there's, yeah. you're around anybody, you just, you really do have to continue to wear the masks and the physical distancing. If you're vaccinated and people around you are vaccinated, that's cool. You don't have to, right? You don't have to wear your, your masks, but, um, and that's sort of tricky because I was telling somebody today the messaging from the government, and of course, we've had two different governments, if you think about it, right, mm -hmm. has not been great. I mean, there's not been a coherent message, right? So no. if I were in charge, this is what I would say, okay? There's no polarization around wearing your seatbelt. Seat belt. Seat belts save lives, period. It's the law. You can't smoke cigarettes publicly. Kids need to get vaccinated to go to school. So instead of making this a political issue, let's look at the health issue that it is and let's have some you know, good discussions. The good news though, I, I just wanna also stress the good news as well. The good news is that the vaccine is very effective. Every time we get more information, we find out that it's even better than what was initially thought. And right. it's safety, again, it's safety continues to, to be shown. And the more and more time and data that we get, the more reassured that we have. And actually today, you know, I was reading an article about how this mRNA technology is gonna have applications for a lot of other illnesses, including cancer. So, um, you know, let, let's just think about it. I understand when something's new, people are hesitant, but try to get the best information possible, blackcoalitionagainstcovid.org, of which the Rodham Institute were on the steering committee and, uh, you know, have those conversations without being judgmental <laughs> or, you know, obnoxious uh, or, or any of that. So that's my two cents. No, I, I think you're, you're, you're raising um, two great points. Uh, the first point is, is that, A, um, there's consequences for either action or inaction, right? So, um, and you've got to weigh those consequences against each other. So if you don't get vaccinated, there are consequences. You are opening up yourself to potentially becoming infected. Um, and you have to have those those restrictions. You have to follow those restrictions at, to a greater degree. Yes. Um, if you're choosing to not be vaccinated, it's not just, I don't want to get vaccinated. Then I go back to my regular life. No, okay. You're not, you're choosing not to get vaccinated. Here are the consequences. If you're choosing to be vaccinated, there are some consequences that come with that. Mm -hmm. um, not as dire, um, but you know, because of the safety and efficacy that has been proven to be of, of the actual vaccine. Yeah. And, and so th I think that those consequences are just coming from just the, the politicalization and the polarization that has come from being vaccinated or not being vaccinated. And I think what's happening and what I'm seeing a lot in society where you've got some states that are entering people that are vaccinated in the lottery systems, you've got, um, I saw one time, and these are extremes, of course, uh, there was a guy that was throwing a concert in Florida and Florida has their own kind of ways about vaccines. And so what he was charging people that were vaccinated, $20 to get to the concert and people that weren't vaccinated, 
a thousand dollars. So he was saying, oh yeah, anybody can come to the concert, but if you know, he was applying a stiffer penalty for those people that were unvaccinated. So there we're getting to extremes. And so I do think we have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, because you know the society has already been kind of splintered of the, the previous leadership. And so I think the, the that political politicalization of the vaccines has really put us in a precarious position as a society because we have to make a decision about, you know, where we stand versus being on the side of, hey, you know, medical and science. Well, it's very interesting when you look at countries who followed sort of their government's mask mandate before we had the vaccine or are getting vaccinated. It's countries who really have, it's, it's societies, I should say, where people have a real sense of um, sort of being responsible to each other and having trust in government. And if you think about our previous administration, that was really frayed. So the, 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 the timing of the pandemic couldn't have happened at a worse time from yeah. the standpoint of the readiness of our society. But be that as it may, you know, it is what it is. And we make the best decisions to keep ourselves, our families and our communities, you know, healthy. And uh, that's what, you know, what, that's what we're here for. And that's what this is all about. Well, that's what this show is all about. It's, it's all about you. It's all about your family's health. And please feel free to ask any questions you might have in the comment section and we will get them asked and answered. And so that's what we're here. This is a house call. This is the, the doctor coming in <laughs> right now. So uh, we're going to take a turn. We're going to bring in our guests because, you know, much like Dr. Gigi and I, even though we are all about getting people vaccinated, we do have a little bit of COVID fatigue and <laughs> we're going to move our discussion off of COVID and onto something that is just as important. Um, and it was here before COVID and it's going to be here after COVID. So we're going to move to something. We're going to bring in our guest to the program right now. Good evening. How are we doing? Hi. Hello. Hey, Ms. Ria. How are How you? How are you? I'm fine. Welcome. Can I just introduce Ms. Ria because sure. she is fabulous. I mean, I'm going to have her introduce herself, but first and <laughs> foremost, Ms. Ria is a friend, a dear beloved mm -hmm. friend. And second, she actually used to be an anchor for the local Channel 7 ABC News here in D.C. Actually, that's how we first met. That's true. That's well, how did I do? How was my intro? How was my Fabulous. Intro? That was wonderful. I'm enthralled with the both of you. I'm just sitting here watching. Yes. Well, so and then actually CNN picked her up to be the health, um, the health correspondent. This is, of course, before... Um, Sanjay Gupta, and uh, okay. she was just amazing there too. And he's now he's at the FDA. <laughs> no, you're, you're just an amazing human being, and just has done a lot in the space of cancer awareness. And Ms. Ria, do you mind introducing yourself in your role? Now? I do not mind at all. Thank you so very much for that generous introduction. I'll add on just a little bit. And uh, hello, Ellis Dean. Uh, it's my pleasure to meet you on this program. And again, it feels like we're all kind of sitting at a dining room table or something. <laughs> so um, I'm very comfortable here. Thank you. I was a little concerned before. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I think just sort of, you know, nerves about what's going to happen. You know, I think Absolutely. somewhat normal. So a little about me, uh, I actually am the Associate Director for External Outreach and Engagement, a long title, at the Oncology Center of Excellence at the Food and Drug Administration. And what I've learned in my short tenure is that most people don't know what the Oncology Center of Excellence <laughs> is. I see a hand going up. <laughs> and look, I really didn't either before I got there because in all honesty, it was really pretty new. Um, it actually is, uh, it was, it was created, signed into existence on the very last day of the Obama administration, hmm. okay. the very last day, eked right in, uh, <laughs> as part of the, uh, Cures Act, um, signed into law actually in the preceding December, but you know, our standing papers are as of January, uh, 19th the following year, 2017. Uh, as part of the Biden moonshot, uh, people may recall that the, the cancer moonshot, when the current president was vice president, it was a big announcement about how we were going to try and you know move science forward. And perhaps this moonshot concept would sort of coagulate all of the different uh, and disparate um, agencies and activities going on. And you know it's the federal government, so there's a lot of silos. But um, that's actually how we got our start. And then I came on board at OCE in 2018. 
uh, and then uh, started a program I'd be happy to tell you about if you want to know uh, in 2019 uh, and would love to tell you more about the National Black Family Cancer Awareness Week, which is our latest initiative. But I don't want to drive the show. I'll, I'll let you <laughs> See, I was kind of getting back into my old role there where it's like, okay, yeah, and then well, the next thing. Yeah. It's, it's, I like was just riding, it's like riding a bike. You never forget, <laughs> right? Dr. Gigi, I was sitting there like, she is a she was really a professional because it was like oh, yeah. everything was flowing. No arms, no arms, no stopping, no I'm calls. holding all those. I it was, well, it was five like, minutes worth of um for you look, at the look, end. Hold up. Would you be surprised that the person I bring on is just going to be fabulous? Come on. I'm, I'm not surprised surprise at all it's just amazing just like to see because i'm you know i'm a, i'm an amateur and it's like oh, okay i'm still trying to figure it out you did a great job well you really but you know are. in all seriousness though i think that um uh, miss ria joining us tonight shows us that the diversity in multiple different settings is yeah. so key to have True. the diverse voices that can rep represent all Americans, right? I mean, right, right. when you think of the FDA, you know, Food and Drug Administration, well, that's really about making sure that our food is safe and medications are safe and getting medications and vaccines approved. But it's so much more. And, you know, when somebody like Ms. Ria is at the table saying, this is important for our communities, this and this and this needs to be done, that matters. So I think when we're thinking about sort of advancing health equity, which, you know, I'm very passionate about. It is also about understanding that we each have our roles to play mm -hmm. in the different settings that we're in. So, um, so anyway, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. But, um, but, uh, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit, you know, I just want to talk about the, the President Biden, and to remind our viewers of why he is so invested in this moonshot. Um, his son, Bo Biden, died of brain cancer. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it was a, just horrible. You know, when he's always talking about support our troops or mm -hmm. God bless the troops, that's because mm -hmm. his son was a vet. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this guy was a, an attorney general, Bo, and he would have probably been, you know, in the Senate and maybe even gone to run for office. And actually, when um, President Biden decided not to run and to have Hillary uh, Clinton run instead, it was because he was still grieving the very horrible loss of his son. So for, for the president, this is a very personal yeah. kind of uh, thing. It's not just, um, you know, oh, we need to do something about them. These are statistics. No. And I think, you know, when you have a president who takes the initiative and kind of puts his his stamp of approval with personal experience, then that means something. It means that it's going to have much more support. And certainly now that he is president and he's going to uh, push that forward. But I mean, would you agree, uh, Ms. Ria? I would. Um, I, I will go as far as to say, um, you know, it, we call it the OCE just for short, because I know I'm going to lapse into that. So the Oncology Center of Excellence, also known as the OCE, uh, we are very proud of the diversity among the staff that work there. Yes, there are oncologists, there are pharmacists, there are toxicologists, there are uh, oncology nurses, their statisticians, you name it, we have people employed there to help make the process work effectively, to basically deliver safe and effective drugs in cancer and hematology uh, to the public. But we also understand the importance of having supportive leadership. And so to that point, I'm glad to drop this little nugget into the conversation because while we were definitely thinking you know, this time last year when COVID truly was raging and, you know, it was a different administration. It was a different world. Let's face it. None of us had experienced that before. And I hope we never do again. Uh, but point being that, you know, when there is strong and definitive leadership, it does make a difference. So we were already at that point planning, OK, what are we going to do to get on the other side of this? And mainly because we knew that while COVID a pandemic, I mean, that doesn't happen that frequently around the globe. It's a pandemic, right? Right. But we also knew that cancer itself existed prior to COVID-19 and many other viruses that have circled the globe eventually. Uh, and we knew that cancer would be there afterwards. And so what we really wanted to do was keep our eye on the ball to A, make sure that people who are uh, involved in cancer clinical trials or who are you know, waiting on drug approvals or the industry, the pharmaceutical companies that are working in research and development knew that the Oncology Center of Excellence was still functioning alive and well, even though 
from our homes, which is where we still are at this point. We've been working remotely for more than a year, as much of America has in many circumstances. But, um, you know, the mission was always to keep patients first, keep patients informed. And many people who are gracious enough to be on cancer clinical trials are also deeply burdened by the process. Unfortunately, clinical trials are not always the easiest thing to participate in. It requires a lot of time. There's a lot of lab tests. You have to check in with you know, various doctors and physicians and, and just, it's, it's a lot of rigmarole, uh, except for the fact that, hey, guess what? It could save your life. And particularly if you're in a situation where there's not a drug approved or nothing is, no treatment option is working for you thus far. So people are willing to endure it. Um, but we know it's burdensome because, you know, it requires you take time off work. You know, maybe you've got to find a babysitter. You've got to go someplace and pay $25 for parking. Maybe you don't have transportation to get there. All of those things make a difference as to whether or not people participate in cancer clinical trials. And because part of our mission is to make sure that we have more people who are more representative of these United States of America, we want to increase the number of minority participants, uh, the underserved, the underrepresented, and most importantly, the most vulnerable in our population. We want everyone to have access to cancer clinical trials because so often they are the standard of care. I think a lot of times people have um, the misconception uh, and it's an absolute myth that, well, you know, you're going to be used as a guinea pig in these tests. You know, you don't really know what they're giving you. It could be a placebo, a sugar pill, not in cancer clinical trials. That would be absolutely positively unethical because we understand the importance of the disease state and that people are at their most vulnerable. We don't play with people's lives like that when it comes to drug review of cancer drugs. So, I mean, it's different if you're, you know, it's a headache medication, you know, maybe you get an aspirin, maybe you get a sugar pill, not with cancer drugs. You will always at least get the standard of care. And I think that's something that if more people knew, they would be more willing to participate because they would recognize that the access that they get, the, the benefit could potentially be that all goes well, the risk could be that it doesn't help you at all, but at least you will get the standard of care. So it's one of those things that, that we do tend to wanna to make sure that we mention in all of our talks and whenever we're interacting with people in the populace, because people tend not to know that. And I think the other thing that, that is really important as we go forward in regards to science, uh, and finding new ways to treat people that are, that are more beneficial uh, is the idea that precision medicine or precision oncology uh, specifically will benefit from more people participating, underserved, underrepresented, vulnerable populations, uh, because again, the more people who are involved in the science, in the study of the information, uh, the more people who donate to genetic databases, and typically, you know, this is a, it might be a blood draw, but it might just be, you know, sputum or, you know, something innocuous, um, but, but it does need to be a bodily fluid. But the point being is that the more people who are represented in those trials, the more people who will benefit from the research that results. Because if the research, like back when I was a health reporter in, at Channel 7 in Washington, uh, I recall that the big deal then was is that women were insisting that they be allowed to participate in clinical mm -hmm. trials because I think like up into the 70s or so, Gigi, it was only white <laughs> men. Try so, 80s you know, and 90s. It's been a progression slowly, but surely, and we need to make sure that everybody is participating That's in right. and So that goes for the genomic databases as well. So right. can, I, can I ask, uh, I'm going to be the devil's advocate here and I'm going to ask the, the, the elephant in the room is this, when we're talking to black people about, and we hear clinical trials, we know what it is, Tuskegee, right? Yes. And so, you know, how do we overcome the apprehension that many Black Americans could understand, could, could understandably feel maybe a little bit PTSD with regards to, you know, kind of shared PTSD with regards to how we are treated, we were treated by that particular study and to say, okay, now we can trust clinical trials. How do we overcome that hurdle? I've got it for you. Now, okay. first and foremost, I too had my version of PTSD. I mean, you know, all you have to do is hear something that's been hidden, that's historically true and factual, that people have tried to sweep under the rug or pretend like it never existed. For example, this is the 100th anniversary of the exactly. Tulsa massacre. I used yep. to live in Tulsa, so, you know, that that's near and dear to me. Um, but in reality, once you get past the horror, and it was horrific, it was 40 years of research. Now, 
research is probably not even the right term. It was no. really diabolical science. I'll put it that way. Because no. in honesty, um, there was penicillin that was created and developed during that 40 year period, not given to these men, African-American men in Tuskegee, Alabama, who volunteered to participate in what they were told would be a six month study. So they were left untreated. They should have been treated. They were never told there was a treatment. They were never told anything in regards to their rights as patients participating in a study. And in right. fact, they were actually treated as subjects like you would lab mice. So it was wrong on every conceivable level. But there was a whistleblower and there was information that came out and it did become uh, you know, publicly known that this was seriously wrong and unethical. And as a result, here's the good news. I gave you a big long lead up, here's the good news. We have institutional review boards and those entities are set up specifically to work on every single clinical trial that takes place in drug development so that nothing like Tuskegee ever happens again. If nothing else, we learned that you've got to keep an eye on people because sometimes they will do the wrong thing. And that was a perfect example of just how wrong wrong could be. But now we have these boards in place. And the beauty of that is, is that it, as a patient, you have so many rights. If you don't understand something, don't just sign anything, mm -hmm. ask, no, find advocates. There's a lot of, you know, the internet didn't exist. I mean, there's all kinds of ways people now can really advocate better for themselves. And unfortunately, those brothers didn't stand a chance. They really didn't because mm -hmm. no one cared enough to make sure that they had a chance. They left people purposely untreated mm -hmm. for decades. It was wrong. So I just want to jump in and say the the survivors of the family members of Tuskegee mm -hmm. actually came forward and they were talking about vaccinations and they were just saying, we promote vaccinations, you know, don't let what happened to our family members, don't let throw the baby out with the bathwater. Exactly. Let's think about, you know, sort of what is being done, what's being helpful. And uh, to your point, Ms. Ria, keeping an eye by oversight. But yes. the IRBs, I think it's important, those institutional review boards um, include lay public, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So, and then for clinical trials, you can sign up, but you can also say, you know what? I thought I was gonna be in it. See you later, I'm it. out, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanna, you know, um, uh, Mr. Ellis knows that I um, talked about my own cancer journey on mm -hmm. this show. And um, so I just want to kind of summarize that up because I'm actually part of a clinical trial myself. Oh, okay. Yes. So um, this was, um, let's see, around the same time last year, actually, I was uh, working in the hospital taking care of COVID patients for a week in May, you know, pretty intense time. And then I noticed that I was um, urinating blood clots. I was like, oh, I knew that wasn't a good thing because I had had a history of uh, breast cancer and I... Uh, People said, well, it's urinary tract infection. I'm like, first of all, blood I clot? never get them. <laughs> Number two, blood clots like this are unusual. I wasn't having any burning or any of these other things. So anyway, and interestingly, my doctor said, it's, it's a UTI, here's some antibiotics. So even mm -hmm. as a physician, hmm. I had to say, no, I don't think that's what's going on. Just to show you, right? Yeah. Right. And so I um, was privileged because I'm a physician, because I work in a hospital system where I know people. I basically called up one of my patients who works in radiology. I said, could you please get me scheduled for a CT scan? Mm -hmm. Sure enough, she did. Um, and of course, I was found to have a tumor in the kidney, got a biopsy right away, you know, got the chemotherapy started and then had my kidney removed. So the privilege of my education and being a healthcare, um, you know, clinician really helped me navigate. Now, mm -hmm. we know that that's not true for the majority of people. You right. Know? Right. I mean, I'm including everybody, right. as, you know, um, but, but then afterwards, you know, with my particular type of cancer, it's a very rare cancer. My oncologist, who's a Euro oncologist, so specifically a cancer specialist in um, a kidney and bladder cancers, uh, said, you know, there is a clinical trial that's going on at the NIH, so that's not far for mm -hmm. me, and it's like the world's authority, um, because there was really, there is some 
there are some medications that are being looked at to prevent the cancer from coming back because thank God I was cured, but we wanted to pre prevent it from coming back. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll sign up. So the arm that I'm in is actually just observation. I could have mm -hmm. gone into treatment with an, uh, a monoclonal antibody or observation. So I randomized into observation, which frankly for me was okay because you know, the, 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 the data about whether this monoclonal antibody works or not was kind of iffy. So I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm getting every three months I'm being looked at, you know, the fine tooth comb. Yeah. I'm getting all my blood tests. It happens to all be free. The people at the NIH could not be nicer. You don't have to worry about referrals and all that. There's free parking. <laughs> and I'm not getting That's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. Serious. That is a very big deal. Yeah. Um, and 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 of course, I think the most important thing to me, probably like the majority of people, is how I get treated. You know yeah. what I mean? It's it's such a you know. I mean, I'll give you a small example. Like you know, you go to the doctor's office, and you, there's usually a long wait, right? Mm. And they have like little lunch ba bags there. And let me tell you, they have the most delicious peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that I actually look forward to going for my appointment. No, but I mean, it's really how, how you're treated. And you right. know, they're just so polite. And I'm like, I'm like, are we in the United States? Because they're just so nice, you know? Yeah. But uh, but, but th th that's an example of, of clinical trials. Yeah. But you know what? See, you've done more for clinical trial participation in that five minutes than some clinicians uh, and and you know principal investigators who you know have teams of people who go out into communities and try and do surveys and sign people up and so forth. And do you know why? Because it's a personal experience from a trusted authority, and that makes all the difference in the world. Now you could you know be saying that you had a bad experience, um, yeah. and you know we'd also be listening. But yeah. this is the kind of word of mouth, honestly, that I wanted to employ as part of this initiative that I briefly mentioned. So I, I gave a tease earlier, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, the yeah. National Black Family Cancer Awareness Week, which is an initiative that we're doing at the Oncology Center of Excellence uh, under Project Community. So I run Project Community. I decided this was the time. We knew that we had a lot of COVID cases. We knew that black and black brown families were adversely impacted. And we knew that cancer was not going to go away in the meanwhile. And in fact, because of people being basically cloistered at home, you know, screenings couldn't really take place. You know, I couldn't get in for my mammogram. You know, there, there's all kinds of things that people would have ordinarily done had they had access to normal life. So we knew that this was going to be a key and seminal moment. Um, the, the beauty, I think, of what we're trying to do is that whole grassroots personal story aspect. We want individual people to consider this their call to action, that they themselves as individual people in neighborhoods and family pods, in communities, you know, at churches, within HBCU alumni associations, um, you know, uh, the Divine Nine, anybody and their brother literally can participate in this. All they have to do is choose to and basically decide how they're gonna do it. So it's, it's a wide open concept that we're just asking people to talk about cancer awareness among black families. And we positioned it in June in particular uh, because it's the month of Juneteenth. Hello. Um, we knew that, you know, eventually one of these years we would all start having family reunions and people would gather together for barbecues and so forth. And look, it's probably happening this year. You know, we didn't have to wait till next year. Uh, but if, if you have to social distance wherever you are, please do be safe. Um, but Juneteenth, also uh, June is Men's Health Month. And we know traditionally, oftentimes it is the female gender that tends to be the family doctor. <laughs> Dr. Gigi, obviously you're a fantastic one and you're a yeah. fantastic one. Um, but uh, we also know that, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit more to get men to pay attention to these issues. You know, this is a, you know. Can, I just, can I just interrupt you for a second? Sure. It turns out that men, when they get married, live oh. longer. But guess what happens to women? We don't. <laughs> I'm serious. This is research. This it's is true. Opinion. So are you telling me I'm killing my wife? Are you saying I'm no, short? I didn't say that. <laughs> research. That's the research. And you know, the research. data shows. You cannot real, ignore the data. Real story is that, uh, you know, I, I work at Black Doctor. I've done, I can't even remember how many of these uh, COVID programs we've done. And it was my wife that set our appointment. 
Yeah. And she said, she's like, oh, I got us an appointment to go get our, our, our vaccination. I was like, oh, yeah, because, you know, <laughs> I've been running through life. And she was like, no, we need to go get it. Um, you're, yeah. It's at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Let's go. Right. <laughs> but you know that said um obviously there are men who do obviously you know take the lead in everything. but we just wanted to make sure that it felt inclusive for everybody and particularly black men because of how cancer impacts our community and honestly i i don't think it takes a genius to figure out that almost every type of major cancer that uh can be thought of either african americans are more likely to be diagnosed with it eventually and or die from it so, uh, you know, we're at really great risk in general for most cancers, but particularly the top four. The number one cancer, the cancer that kills most people is lung cancer. And I know that often surprises people because they think, well, why? Because, you know, aren't people not smoking as much? But there are types of lung cancer that have nothing to do with smoking. Um, and, and the stigma of, oh, I don't smoke, so I don't have to care is something that we have to battle against. So, and I won't go into T CT scans and so forth because that's out of my lane, Dr. Gigi, but you know, th there are reasons that people should be screened that often physicians don't even think of because we just haven't worked around it in our mind that, okay, you don't have to be a smoker to get lung cancer. Then the second most common cancer among African-Americans um, is colorectal. And there we have the opportunity for great impact. Um, and in fact, recently there was a reduction in the minimum age for screening. So it used yeah. to be like 50, I don't know, X number yes. of years ago, but in yeah. the last month or two, they have brought the number down to 45. And I think that's for average healthy people with no family history, no previous concerns. So if you're an African-American, uh, and we know that colorectal cancer particularly impacts African-Americans more so than the average population. I think 20 percent more cases in the African-American community and we're like 40 percent more likely to not live after having colorectal cancer. Um, you know, we need to be on the lookout. So that's, while, uh, that's the Chadwick Boseman. Um, that's exactly. Right. That's yeah. Chad, OK. And yeah. I think I think it, unfortunately if there was one positive out of it because I was. I hear you. About, but. It was it brought greater awareness, awareness. to, yep. to yep. Um, getting called out. And you know what? That's the thing is that you know when you say that, that it does register for people. So that's mm -hmm. the very kind of thing I'm saying. You know, for National Black Family Cancer Awareness Week, which by the way begins June 17th through the 23rd. Got the date across the bottom. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, we're we're going to do a panel discussion uh, from the Oncology Center of Excellence at the FDA, and there's a registration for that. And I did drop something in the chat. I hope everybody can see it. Um, and maybe I only did it privately. So if there's a break at some point, somebody let me know and I'll try to put it in the right place. But point being, um, our panel discussion is available to the public, but the rest of the week we're asking people to participate in a social media campaign of your own choosing. Other than we are asking you to use the hashtag, get ready for it, hashtag Black Fam Can. Oh, mm. hashtag Black Fam Camp, because we can do this. We can have these, you know, important family history conversations. And with colorectal cancer in particular, there are actually hereditary syndromes that predispose one to colorectal cancer. And again, thank you. Somebody's on the ball. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that, you know, yes, you might want to graciously talk about it with your elders because, you know, not everybody is of the mindset of some of us younger folks where we can talk about this stuff because we understand, you know, at this age, you need to have that conversation. Maybe your 90 year old grandmother may not be as comfortable talking about cancer. However, it's important for every generation to know so they know what they're up against. They know how to possibly protect themselves. They know that they might need to go for screenings earlier in life than the recommended screening for the average people with no family history. So all these things are key, not to mention diet, exercise, you know, everything else that we can do. HPV vaccinations. There are lots of people who still have no idea that they could actually be helping prevent cancer in their adolescence when they grow older by getting them vaccinated as adolescents. It's a simple thing. It's, it's like going in for the measles shot. It's you just add it on the list. I'm sure most pediatricians are now talking about it, but I remember when that first uh, became available, that was a big controversy because you know no one wanted and to- And that's for boys and girls, correct? 
Yes, that's right. absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely. for both. That's non-gender specific. So I think a lot of times, especially when we do HPV, you know, we automatically think. And you're right. Originally, yeah. I do believe it was it was targeted toward young girls. Yes. Right? that might have been part of the controversy because it's yes. like, well, wait a minute, you know, yes, yeah. it's sexual. Yeah, I'm having sex with somebody. somebody. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I learned yeah. On. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Miss Ria, there's a lot that you have just shared, but I want to kind of go back to some of the basics. Because um, the, the reality is, is that since COVID and the pandemic, mm -hmm. there's been a drop by almost a third of new cancer diagnoses. And of course, a lot of the data is not out yet because the healthcare system has been so focused on COVID. Mm -hmm. And we know that when it comes to black and brown communities, uh, say in the area of breast cancer, okay, which I've had 15 years ago, on average, at least in Washington, D.C., there is a 90-day delay between the time the woman gets symptoms to the time that she gets diagnosed and a six-month delay between the time that she's having symptoms, right, or an abnormal test and getting treatment started. And time is, time is, is crucial. Right. The, the, the soonest, sooner that you can get treated, the better. I also want to make the distinction between screening if you have zero symptoms versus somebody like me, because we don't do any screening for, for kidney cancer, right? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I was having symptoms, right? right. So mm -hmm. all the screening recommendations go out the door if you're having symptoms, then you have to have the procedure, yeah. right? So yes, uh, people get colon cancer screening at the age of 45, but if they had a relative, like, I don't know if Chadwick Boseman has children, but certainly if he's got siblings, his siblings should get screened at age 35 because he had it so early, if not even age 30, that's number one. If he had blood in his stools, I don't care how old he is, right. he should get a colonoscopy. So I think that those are really important. And then to add to what you said, um, Ms. Ria, the fourth cause of death is then prostate and breast cancer and breast. Mm -hmm. um, for, for men and women. And I think a lot of times people think that colon cancer is just a male disease. It's not, as you said, okay? It's it's both men and women that get it. And that, pro I think we should think about prostate and breast as being kind of the, the female, because the, the, the breast is a gland, just like the prostate is a gland. Mm -hmm. And they're both affected by, you know, sort of hormones and fat is something that can increase the risk. Um, and so, uh, and then finally, if I just want to say, because I've done studies on this. So, you know, when I was first diagnosed with breast cancer 15 years ago, there, I mean, there were a couple of genetic tests that people could do. But if you weren't really Ashkenazi Jewish, you know, it wasn't something that was necessarily offered. Now, okay, because of clinical trials, because more people are participating, there are many more genes to check for, okay? not all the genes, but at least there are more. So when we get a family history, like I saw somebody the other day, she's got a very strong family history on both sides of her family mm -hmm. of a variety of cancers, mm -hmm. pancreatic, leukemia, breast. I'm like, ooh, you need to go see a, a, a genetic oncologist or a doctor you know, who specializes in cancer to get some genetic screening because mm -hmm. we may need to screen you differently. So for her, her dad died of pancreatic cancer. So guess what? I'm going to do an abdominal MRI on her because that's really the only test that you can, can do on her. So mm -hmm. it, cancer is not just the four that sort of we mentioned, right. but it is, you know, just knowing what the family history is. And then my final point is, you know, when, when I was growing up, you know, um, we would go to Egypt in the summertime my grandmother would say it's that word that you don't mention it's an unmentionable you don't it's you know now they say c word or so forth so yeah. to your point the older generations there's a lot of stigma mm -hmm. and then i have a friend a colleague who was diagnosed with with breast cancer and one of her patients said i don't want you to do my colonoscopy because i might catch the cancer from you oh no but because there are all these myths that are out there. Though. There's a lot of myths. I, I, you know, I'm since I'm the the kid that sat in the back of the classroom. I'm gonna I'm gonna break it down for the, for the folks that, that um, So number one is 
we're having these programs. We're here with Dr. Gigi. And if you're just joining us, we're here with Rhea Blackton from the FDA. We're here with Dr. Gigi and House Call. And number one is so you can be your own best health advocate. Your primary care physician is your primary care physician. And so it's important that you don't let them drive that whole appointment time. You have to be in the driver's seat or at least riding shotgun with them. If they're going to drive it because they're the, they're the medical professional, you should be riding shotgun and navigating. Say, I need you to look at this. I need you to turn here, turn left here, doctor. Be your own best health advocate. Number two, I what I need for you to do is to get a family history. Talk to your mom. Talk to your grandparent. Talk to your father. Find out what the family history is so you can be armed. So when you go in to see your primary care physician, when you go in to see your health care provider, you can have that information so they can start. So you can send that message to them saying we might need to start looking at this at an earlier point in time. If you do not provide an accurate family history, it's not going to pop up on their radar and you're not going to be screened for it earlier. So that's number two. Number three, you have to be able to have a conversation. You have to say it. I know we used to whisper, we used to say cancer, we say it really low. And we would say the C word. We wouldn't talk about it as families. We wouldn't talk about it with our spouse. It was just, you'd whisper, oh, it's cancer. And we can't do that anymore. Yeah. It's it's life or death. And it's literally life or death. We have to have these conversations. We have to get, we have to put our fears aside. Go get screened. Go get prostate, uh, your colonoscopy. Go get everything you need, your mammograms. Whatever you, screening you need to do, get it done because it's important and it's life or death. So we got to let go all these stigmas. We got to let those myths of if I, if I get surgery for this cancer, when you cut me open, I'm going to get cancer. All of those myths and you got to let them go. Wives got to let them go. Go get the real information from your provider. All right. I'm off my soap box. I'm done. Well, and then for the, for the colonoscopy too, um, for people who are not at risk or who don't have symptoms, there's now another way to test and that's Cologuard. So like I say, this is an area where there's so much that's changing. So, you know, even as a doctor, I have to, you know, check with my specialty colleagues because things are evolving so quickly in terms of screening tests as well as treatment. So, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a lot there. So, so Ms. Ria, what are some of the examples of the, the hashtag Black fam cam. I knew you could do it. I, <laughs> I know I could. I'm like, I know. <laughs> um, uh, the things that we're asking people to do, and by the way, uh, there is, uh, I'm, thank you very much, Ellis. In the chat box, there is the link for the actual social media toolkit. Um, so the very first day, June 17th, the Oncology Center of Excellence, OCE, is having this public panel discussion. You do need to register, so please do use that link. And then if you scroll about halfway down in the social media toolkit page, which is where the link goes, um, you will see the you know big graphic for June 17th and the panel discussions happening from 2 to 3.30 on that day. And we have some stellar guests on that particular panel. Um, what we're asking people to do the rest of the, the week, though, is really up to them. So, you know, people might decide that they want to have a... Uh, panel discussion of their own, maybe at their church health and wellness group, or uh, they're going to get together with their sorority sisters or their fraternity brothers and talk about prostate cancer awareness for the month. And by the way, National Cancer Survivor Day is also in the month of June, which was another good reason to pick this month. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, um, you know, people might decide they want to do 5Ks, or maybe they're going to get together a group of people who uh, typically are foodies, maybe, but they're going to share recipes about healthier um, options for, you know, recipes that they might create. And I don't know, maybe they'll have a contest or a cook-off or something. That would be fun. Um, or, you know, anything that comes to mind for you that is engaging and interesting. And when we talk about engaging the generations, we're also talking about these younger students as well. So if you know kids who are, you know, like I'm going to say fifth through eighth grade who might be interested in STEM programs, who have an aptitude for math or science or just, you know, endlessly curious about something, this would be a great time to engage them. Maybe they could come up with uh, you know, graphic design books or, or, you know, card games or something that, that, I don't know, Monopoly for Science about cancer. I'm making it up, but some kid can come up with it and do hey, it, it special. You know what I mean? Can so I tell you, can... when I was in fifth grade growing up in Michigan, public schools in Michigan, uh -huh. they had one class where they brought a, a mannequin with cotton lungs and she had been smoking. 
And huh. so we could see the effect of smoking, right? So my mother was studying for her graduate degree and this one quote friend was trying to get her to start smoking. So as a result of that one hour class, me and of course I got my brother and sister to grab any cigarettes that she had and throw them in the incinerator because we lived in married uh, student housing. And just that one educational initiative prevented my mom from being mm. a smoker. Mm -hmm. So children actually, I get, you know, when, I'm, when I have people that are um, smokers, I actually often enlist the kids and the grandkids yeah. to, to help with that. But I do want to just mention something briefly because I think sometimes people forget about the daily habits that we have, mm. including uh, drinking wine, beer, or hard uh, hard liquor. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of what seems like conflicting information, but when it comes to cancer, yeah. women should have no more than seven drinks in a week. And it doesn't matter if it's beer, wine, hard liquor, and men no more than 14, because men can metabolize it much more quickly. So for women and men, if you even if you have even more than than three per week or more you know seven per, or less than seven 14 your risk for cancer really starts to go up significantly True. two and three times of course we know about tobacco yes we know about um we know about high fat diets um so a lot of great information on bdo blackdoctor.org so you know and i'm hearing that from dr gg and of course i'm thinking about my own behaviors and i'm thinking about also i'm also thinking about what has transpired during um the pandemic right when we were on this this kind of year-long lockdown during 2020 and yes we all have a kind of a worldwide ptsd as a result of what happened with the pandemic and being locked into you know basically being relegated to our homes but what what also happened is many of us Increased our alcohol intake during that time because that was that became an activity now, right? <laughs> As a pacifier, and also too, we started increasing our intake of just foods, and a lot of those foods weren't the healthiest foods because what, what it was, what is available. So it, that also became a pacifier, and so when you couple that with the information that we talked about earlier in terms of screenings going down, visits to the hospitals going down, uh, visits to our primary care physician going down. That is a recipe for a dangerous number of cancer uh, happening in yeah. subsequent years as as we emerge from this pandemic. So oh, you're absolutely uh, right. I think the importance of, and 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 Rhea, I, I really want you to really kind of stress this appointment of, um, importance for our audience is that that's why it's Black Family Cancer Awareness Week. We all have to do it together, whether it's coming from the kids or whether it's coming from grandma or anybody in between, the family has to get together because we have been engaging, a lot of us, and I'm speaking for myself, have been engaging in some risky behaviors over the while we were locked down. And so we've got to get back to being healthy as a, not only as an individual, but as a family and as a community. Oh no, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, this tagline, engaging the generations, really is part of the call to action simply because of what you're saying that you know it, it we know it takes a village uh, you right. know in this case it, it takes an entire universe because obviously cancer has been around for a while cancer disparities have been around forever you know we've got 400 years of unfair uh, treatment in a country mm -hmm. where you know it's stressful pstd is every single day because you never yeah. really know what's going to happen to anybody at any time so right. you know there's all these stressors that by the way i'm sure there's some scientific evidence that that too plays a role in oh, you know, for sure. cortisol cortisol absolutely yeah. so you know trying to stay in my lane over here but point being <laughs> is that you know we're all in it together and and i should also stress that while it is called national black family cancer awareness week because honestly we wanted to focus on the most vulnerable and it was just crystal clear during the start of covid when you know some people had their blinders off and suddenly were paying attention and saying oh wow look at that isn't that interesting how you know so deeply impacted they are yes and it's been happening in so many different ways so point being that you know while people are woke we want to make sure to keep everyone awake and let everybody know that they can participate. This is not just black people are not the only people who are participating in this. We're talking about all people who care about black families, and that really should be everyone. So there's no reason why you can't participate in your own way. 
Don't make it complicated. Keep it as simple as possible. If you do want to do sort of a family cancer history, there actually are um, some really great resources through the uh, CDC. There's, there's literally a family cancer history booklet toolkit that will take you through the questions to ask, oh. um, you know, how to do it respectfully with elders, how to incorporate the kids in it. Because let's face it, if you don't tell the children what's going on, they can't continue the good works that you've started. So it's important to have all aspects of the family involved. And, you know, family is concentric circles. You know, it's not just the three of us on this screen. It's the three of us and everybody in the chat and everybody that they know and everybody that knows them and everybody in their states and so on and so forth. So right. it, it's truly all of us. And, and we really do want it to be an effort that everybody takes some ownership in because cancer disparities are just not necessary and they hold us all down. The least common denominator when it comes to cancer equity needs to come up. There's no exactly. reason why we can't do this. Black fam can. That's the hashtag. <laughs> well, I get excited I, about it. I know I'm intense. But no, no, no. But I think that um, you, you bring up such important points. And I know that Tom Joyner for years has had, you know, take a family member to the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. Every year he has that. And so, and then there are lots of other initiatives I know here in DC. Um, one of the Channel Nine, I think, she used to have, a, you know, a program to get women to buddy up and get their mammograms yes, or to remind that. each other yeah. of that. So there are all kinds of ways. But this is what I would say to you, Mr. Ellis: We were coping the best that we could during the <laughs> pandemic. No, seriously. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so you know, this we're this is a time, and you know, the amazing thing, I, I find this amazing about the human body, that even when we have not taken care of ourselves, if we start taking care of ourselves, the body actually responds pretty quickly and it's forgiving, it's amazing, yep. and it can heal and repair itself. So it is never too late. Never. And no, you don't have to be, you know, like not moving at all to running a marathon, you know, no. just start off very slowly, take it easy for, with yourself. I say, you know what, don't you add to the conversation and the negative messages about this. Oh, I'm too fat. I'm too, the no, no, you just do what you can start where you are. Um, Build mm -hmm. on it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's enough judgment out there. Exactly. Don't add start to by that. walking. Just start by walking 15 yeah. 20 minutes a day, do something active and then making those healthy choices. This is also, June is also a uh, soul food uh, awareness month. And so- Oh, is it? Yes. And so we have to be careful because as black folks, you know, our soul food has, is high fat. So, but you can still- Healthy recipes. There are lots of good recipes. Change your recipes, right? So, so we're going to be doing a whole series this entire month on Black Dr. Aurora about how what? to take those soul food recipes and make them healthier. Still enjoy your flavor. I love my flavor, yeah. but make them healthier for you and your family. But if you think about it, a lot of the soul foods are extremely healthy, right? Well, it's, it's a lot of greens and potatoes. It's right. It's exactly. It's what, it's, how it. you put, it's what you put on. It's what we put in it. You know, we yeah. put that whole hand on. Yeah, yeah, literally what you put on. <laughs> <laughs> but the essence of them is actually very healthy. Very, very good. So, Dr. Gigi, I would be remiss because I, I promised this uh, viewer that she'd stay with us the entire time. So, Gamal, uh, Jeffrey Stewart, I'm gonna, I, I promise I would ask this question. Uh, she's asking some questions. She said, could you touch on CHF? I think that's congestive heart failure. Sure. Um, she is saying that she has been diagnosed with it. Um, but she said it's not that bad. But at the same time, she was told if her feet and her leg uh, swell or to go to an emergency room ASAP. So she would just want to know if you could just talk a little bit about, about CHF a little bit to kind of sure. speak some of her fears and doubts about having Sure. I think Gamal is a man's name. At least it is in Egypt, Gamal. Okay. So just to just to say that, because I think it's a man, but whomever, man or okay. woman, like Yeah, to I'm sorry if I'm... If I, if That's I'm okay. So gender. heart failure is when the heart is not pumping blood forward. And that could be for any number of reasons, but the main reason is that the pump of the heart is weak, okay? Now, most of the time, that can be because people have had previous heart attacks or that their blood pressure has not been well controlled, so the heart gets large, and then with time, it does not function as well. Now, the good news, actually, we just had a, a, a huge a conference on this, the good news is that the treatments are life-saving now. 
So uh, some of the signs that you're getting into trouble, first of all, you should weigh yourself every day. You should have a scale that you can now get on Amazon for 15 bucks and weigh yourself every day if you have congestive heart failure. Because if your weight starts to go up, that's actually the first sign that you should call your doctor and you and your doctor may have already agreed about increasing the diuretic or the pill that gets rid of extra fluid. When you have swelling in the feet and ankles, um, you know, going to the emergency department or not is something that uh, Mr. or Ms. Gamet has to call and know mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, has communication with, with their clinician. That's important. I can't speak to individual cases. But where there's no question you should go to the emergency department is if you're having any difficulty breathing or you're having any chest tightness. Because what happens when the heart is not pumping well, guess what? That fluid backs up into your lungs. So mm -hmm. you can't get, catch your breath. It's also the, the fluid collects in your feet and ankles. You can't lay down. You have to use several pillows to prop yourself up. You can wake up in the middle of the night, short of breath. You can even cough and you can cough up like frothy uh, phlegm. Uh, I mean, that's all together. It's not cough yeah. by itself, it's heart failure. And there are different levels of heart failure. There's, you know, level one, two, three, and four. So it tells you how bad it is. But now the treatment has become more complicated, I would say, not only look for a cardiologist, but if you have actually a heart failure cardiologist, that would be the best if you have them in your area. Because th this is an area where, just like back in the day with HIV, when HIV first came out, I could treat it because there was like two drugs. Now right. you have to really see a specialist. With heart failure, it's the same. We know that things like salt, a lot of people, people forget that salt in food, as well as alcohol, can make your heart failure worse. So getting educated, you should be in charge of, you know, what's your weight, what's your blood pressure? You have a blood pressure cuff, you should have it charted. You know, what are the foods that get you into trouble? What are the foods? So you should really um, speak to your clinician. And I will say doctors were not that good about having those specific conversations. Sometimes the uh, nurse or the uh, nutritionist um, and, and, and by the way, if you're not getting your questions answered, go to somebody else. Go to somebody else. Find out from your friends or family or go to blackdoctor.org. Oh, who's a good cardiologist? Okay, because you know what? Studies show that when black and brown clinicians take care of black and brown people, Better they outcomes. live longer. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, this is, again, this is That's a fact. That's Just fact. saying. More, more <laughs> adhere to uh, their treatment plans, and they're, and, and because they're more adhere to treatment plans, they have better health outcomes. They, they share more information. It goes all the way down, and that's just a, a, a direct result. That's the impetus behind blackdoctor.org is to get people information directly that is culturally competent so they can talk about how these illnesses and ailments are affecting black people from that perspective and not just from the mainstream perspective. So thank you for that, Dr. Dr. Gigi. Uh, Gamal, I hope you got the information and I see you, you're responding. So uh, she said it is, she is female and she Sorry. said she's, she's on oxygen. So I think that was one of those combo uh, Facebook pages where, where husband and wives, they, they do it together. Oh, so, okay. Right. So yeah, I, I have friends that do that too. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. So. We are really, we're pushing up against our time. I told you, I told you before the start of the trip, that this hour is going to fly by. It's going you did to say it. <laughs> so, just want to say, I, I pat myself on the back. I'm, I'm a dislocated. You were correct. But I said I was right. So I want to give you the opportunity to make this last pitch for Black, well, I got to make this a Black National Black Family Cancer Awareness Week. I'm going to put the banner up here. So give the last pitch so people can really understand how this week is important and how it can change the conversations for our families and save our lives. It's precisely what you said. It can change the conversations for our families and save our lives and make the most vulnerable people in the United States of America when it comes to cancer, less vulnerable in the long run if we each do our part and we all have a role to play whether it's your personal story, whether you need to be a better advocate for yourself and your own health in regards to your daily habits, 
whether it's uh, encouraging other people to, you know, power on to thank caregivers for goodness sake, because, mm -hmm. you know, people are looking out for you. You know, it does take a village, but you're part of the village. So do your part. Mm -hmm. Hashtag Black Fam Can. If there's any confusion whatsoever, Google National Black Family Cancer Awareness Week and all of the information will appear magically on your screen. <laughs> Love it. Download the toolkit. It's in the comments. I put it Thank on you. YouTube as well as I put it twice on Facebook, once on YouTube. Click on it. Download the toolkit. Click, click. Thank get, you. Get like we're in a, we're in a poetry reading. Oh, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That's I will put that on screen. I, we appreciate you know all of our audience because again, this this program is about you, and it's always been that way. Uh, Dr. Gigi, uh, I, I, I've told this story before. She's she, the best. She was my very first interview when I started working for Black Doctor. And I literally started on that Monday, and they told me that day, they said, okay, um, yeah, you're going to do a Facebook Live on Wednesday. <laughs> Well, she was probably one of my first two when I worked and, was, <laughs> and that is, is truly how we got connected, and I have never let go. Oh, well, my goodness. And okay. I just started just taking all something? these notes on, on her life. <laughs> well, can I just say something? This person that's on the other, you know, that's part of this panel is a fabulous dancer. And we love to listen to live music. And I cannot wait to be able to listen to some live music. Come on. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you. Yeah. Because yeah. we've heard Denise Williams perform. We've Who's possibly Thomas? heard yeah. they've done um, Prince tributes, Earth, Wind, and Fire. There was a Phyllis Hyman tribute. I would be remiss oh. if I didn't mention that. My significant other would have a fit if we didn't mention <laughs> Phyllis yes. Hyman. And he's a great yeah. dancer, too. Yeah, yeah. She, was, she was special. She was very, very special and, and yeah. it's tragic tragedy. So yes. I just want to say, uh, Ms. Rhea, it has been phenomenal meeting you. <laughs> Uh, I'm tickled by being Miss Rhea all evening. I usually <laughs> just Rhea, but okay, all right. I'm by Dr. Gigi's lead. That she called everybody Miss. I can't so. help it, you know. I can't. Help it. it is your habit. That's true. She never does it in person because we're friends. Yeah. You know, but, but you know, it's a, but that's okay. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very, very much. And Gigi okay. is the best. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank so you. Thank you all for joining us again. So thank in two you. weeks. I'm going to I'm going to pub our next show in two weeks. We're going to be talking all about cholesterol. We're going to continue our series in terms of being your own best health advocate and getting you the information you need so you can go in and talk to your doctor and have a real conversation with your doctor. So last time we talked about blood pressure. Two weeks, we're going to talk about cholesterol, what it is, what is HDL, what is LDL and what does it mean in terms of your heart and your overall health. So we'll be breaking that down in two weeks. So get all your questions together. We will talk to you in two weeks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Oh, Black Good night. Bye.